recess at any time. Without objection, so ordered. I also ask that our members and witnesses be mindful of our three city commandments. We start on time, check. Uh, we use language that the average American can understand, so please uh, limit the use of acronyms and jargon if you can. And we will enforce the five minute rule, which also includes uh, witnesses' responses. So we'll do my best to keep this moving. Uh, with that, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here today for uh, our hearing on the Department of Defense's cyberspace activities. We ask a lot from the department in this space, from securely operating networks and inherently insecure weapon systems to assisting small and large businesses with their interaction with the defense industrial base. However, more important than anything else is how prepared and capable we are to hold our adversaries at risk. I've repeatedly expressed my concerns about the department's pace for growing and modernizing the ships, the aircraft, and the weapons that are required for a potential fight with China if we accept that we need more time to build the platforms required for a kinetic conflict. It's my genuine belief that our ability to robustly use information and cyber operations should provide us with the opportunity to buy time to maneuver for our kinetic forces. While there have been some signs of progress, such as the first delivery of a budget built through the Cybercom Commander's Enhanced Budgetary Authority, there are still wide gaps in where we are today and where we need to be very soon. There are chronic issues such as force readiness, lack of sufficient intelligence support to cyberspace operations, and the shortcomings in agile acquisition of cyber capabilities that continue to plague the cyber force. These problems aren't new, and it's actually remarkable how much effort Congress has expended on pulling and pushing the department to embrace the promise of cyber operations. Since 2013, Congress has tried to address force design and readiness through 24 different pieces of legislation, 24. And over that same period, we've tried to address the civilian and military cyber workforce dilemma 45 times. Cybercom acquisition matters 12 times, and defense industrial-based cybersecurity 42 times, and the list goes on. More frustrating is that the country's collective capabilities and readiness are seemingly no better off because of it. In the words of Albert Einstein, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different outcomes. So I look forward to hearing why I am not insane from our witnesses, Dr. John Plum, uh, serving as both the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy and the Principal Cyber Advisor, as well as General Paul Nakasone, the seasoned commander of U.S. Cyber Command. And with that, I will recognize the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for appearing before us today and the men and women you represent. Thank you, General Paul Nakasone, for meeting yesterday and for your uh, ideas on uh, recruitment, uh, as well as your suggestions on how we can continue to keep uh, our nation safe from cyber attacks. Our adversaries continue to use cyberspace to conduct malicious activities against the United States, its allies, and its interests. Uh, these include Iran, Russia, and China. I applaud the Department of Defense and U.S. Cyber Command for the progress that's been made in recent years. Certainly the change in posture in the past five years has been quite remarkable as, we've as we have transitioned to a posture of defend forward. But we certainly still have work to do. China aggressively uses cyberspace to obtain economic advantage and gather sensitive information. Uh, also, unfortunately, the CCP has been the prime uh, mover of a lot of trade secret theft, IP theft, which I'm particularly aware of given that companies in my district in Silicon Valley have been the targets. Russia continues to engage in malicious activities to achieve its ends, and the governments of Iran and North Korea, as well as malicious and profit-motivated profit actors, continue to act to further their own interests. Our cyber forces are engaged every day in the whole of government effort to defend the country, and given our uh, decentralization and our focus on privacy, this task is harder for us than for many other nations. With these growing th threats, then must come increased attention. I appreciate that uh, we are going to be supporting the Cyber Command in this President's budget, especially in areas of force readiness, training, and support for partners and allies in efforts such as Hunt Forward. The committee is tracking challenges associated with growing, retaining, and tra training the force and I want to make sure we can continue to discuss that effort in greater detail and look forward to some creative ideas you may have of how our committee can help the recruitment of first-class talent in technology. As I said to uh, the general, I want to make sure that 
some of the most talented folks aren't just going to do IPOs and make, become multimillionaires, but also serving the country. I also hear, hope to hear about the command's service-like authorities, including enhanced budget control. Thank you, and with that, Mr. Chair Chairman, thank you for convening the hearing, and I yield back. Dr. Plum, you are recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman Gallagher. Thanks, uh, Ranking Member Khanna and distinguished members of the committee. Good morning. Thanks for inviting me to testify on the Defense Department's cyber posture. I'm honored to appear alongside uh, General Naksoni. As Secretary Austin said from his first days in office, the People's Republic of China is the department's pacing challenge, while Russia remains an acute threat. This is as true in cyberspace as it is in any other warfighting domain. For decades, China has used its cyber capabilities to steal sensitive information, intellectual property, and research from U.S. public and private sector institutions, including the defense industrial base. Today, in competition, Chinese cyber intrusions are the most prolific in the world. In crisis, PRC leaders believe that achieving information dominance will enable them to seize and keep the strategic initiative, disrupt our ability to mobilize, to project and sustain the joint force, and to ensure the PRC's desired end state. Russia engages in persistent malicious cyber activities to support its global espionage campaigns, steal intellectual property, disrupt critical infrastructure, and promote disinformation. Russia has also demonstrated that it views cyber as a key component of its wartime strategy. At the outset of its full-scale invasion of Ukraine in early 2022, Russia conducted cyber operations against Viasat, a U.S. satellite company, to degrade the command and control of the Ukrainian forces and enable Russian maneuvers. Other persistent threats arise from North Korea, from Iran, and from transnational criminal organizations. Together, our adversaries use cyberspace to conduct operations against the Department of Defense Information Network, the DODEN, and the U.S. homeland. They do this to weaken our allies and partners and to undermine U.S. interests. Since 2018, the Department has recognized that it is not enough to maintain a defensive posture while preparing for conflict. We also must defend forward to meet our adversaries and disrupt their efforts in competition. That is the day-to-day -day struggle. Today, the department campaigns in and through cyberspace to sow doubt among our competitors. We conduct intelligence-driven hunt-forward operations to generate insights into our competitors' tactics while defending U.S. allies and partner computer networks. And we disrupt malicious cyber actors through offensive operations. The department is also prioritizing capacity building efforts for our allies and partners who serve as a strategic advantage and a force multiplier that our adversaries can never hope to match. The President's fiscal year 2024 budget request prioritizes investments in all aspects of cyberspace, our people, our organization, our operations, our intelligence, and our capabilities. The request includes $13.5 billion for cyberspace activities which is an increase of $1.8 billion from the enacted level in FY23. These investments will enhance the Department's cybersecurity, they'll increase capacity for cyberspace operations, they will advance research and development activities for new cyber capabilities. The budget requests $7.4 billion for cyberspace operations, including nearly $3 billion for U.S. Cyber Command. These resources will go directly to supporting our cyber mission forces, protecting the homeland, and addressing the threats posed by our adversaries in cyberspace. And I'll, I'll just say, uh, Chairman Gallagher, I do think we are better off, and we are getting better every day. And I think the help from the Congress and these continued investments, uh, we're more prepared, we're more effective, uh, and we're integrating cyber more and more into our operations. Operating in cyberspace today is an essential part of the Department's ability to deter aggression and ensure our nation's security. Our adversaries continue to extend and evolve their cyber capabilities. They're exercising them in both competition and conflict to degrade our advantages and increase their own. The department is committed to strengthening both our defensive and offensive cyber capabilities and to maturing our cyber forces in partnership with this committee. So thank you for your tireless support of the department, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. General Noxoni is recognized for five minutes. Chairman Gallagher, Ranking Member Khanna, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm honored to testify beside Assistant Secretary Dr. John Plum. Joining me today is Command Sergeant Major Cheryl Lyon, the U.S. Cyber Command and NSA Senior Enlisted Leader. We're honored to represent the military and civilian members of U.S. Cyber Command. In the contested cyberspace domain, 
U.S. Cyber Command acts against foreign adversaries that threaten our nation through malicious cyber activity and enables actions by our federal, private, and allied partners. Last fall, a combined U.S. Cyber Command NSA election security group countered malicious cyber actors and oversaw measures to enable the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI, among other domestic partners, to defend the recent midterm elections. The 2022 election cycle proceeded from primaries to certifications without significant impacts due in part to our effort. Going forward, issue, success for U.S. Cyber Command will be measured how effectively foreign adversarial actors are prevented from achieving their strategic objectives. Last year saw significant maturation for U.S. Cyber Command, but our work is not done. In 2023, we must continue to focus on our people, our partners, and our ability to deliver a decisive advantage. We must improve readiness, bolster our reliance, or I'm sorry, bolster our resilience, and maintain a culture of continuous improvement. We will continue to deliver warfighting advantage for the joint force and allied partners through competition, crisis, and conflict. We are doing so by executing our unique authorities to build and sustain campaigns in and through cyberspace and the information environment. Through these efforts, we seek to counter adversaries and competition, to deter, to, to deter conflict, and to prevail against aggression. Aligning efforts of both U.S. Cyber Command and NSA is essential to achieving these goals and is in the best interest of the nation and national security. It all starts with people. The men and women of U.S. Cyber Command working with NSA and partners here and abroad, we win with people. The men and women of United States Cyber Command are grateful for the support of this committee and Congress has given to our command. I look forward to answering your questions. That was a very efficient opening statement. Uh, we will now uh, move into the Q&A portion of the hearing. Uh, Dr. Plum, last year's NDAA authorized a new Assistant Secretary of Defense for cyberspace policy. I'm, I'm confident that the Senate is uh, ready to rapidly confirm a nominee, um, have many conversations to that effect. Can you explain why we're not seeing one? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, the department is uh, has taken the language from the 23 NDAA, and we are trying to make sure that we create ASD Cyber uh, in a deliberate uh, manner that has the most positive effect. Uh, so what we are doing is following the template that was used to create uh, my current position, ASD for space, uh, which is putting a FFRDC uh, on contract to uh, examine what's the proper structure, are there different re different pieces required, what things should be in this uh, cyber ASD ship and not. We're looking at uh, components of electronic warfare, components of information warfare, what should belong. Uh, that is on contract now. We expect uh, that that study should be done uh, around September, uh, but we are moving forward on it. We just want to do it right. So the earliest uh time in which we'd see a nominee would be after the report in September? I mean, I, any... To be totally fair, that is uh, above my pay grade, but that's what I would anticipate, yes, sir. Okay. Um, that's disappointing. Um, we sat down a few weeks ago, and uh, you talked about just the, the number of reports that have, are foisted on you by Congress. Um, on one level, I, I agree. I think we, we insert far too many uh, reporting requirements into the NDAA, and, um, uh, and it just sort of grows and grows without sort of cleaning out uh, the number of reports that don't actually get read. Um, on the other hand, we do it to draw attention to significant issues that we think are important without actually having to micromanage the department in with statutory language. Um, and the best way to avoid reports is to provide us quick but comprehensive answers to the questions that we're asking the department. Do you happen to know how many reports that are related to cyber that the Department of Defense is delinquent on right now? I don't have an exact number. I'd imagine it's around 10. It's 15 reports, 15. So I, I just would submit there's got to be a better way we can get answers to these questions. And I'm happy to work with you and your team uh, to come up with that uh, solution. Because the current posture, in, in my, in my uh, view, is, is unacceptable. Um, and speaking of reports, we, we, uh, you produced the 2022 Cyber Posture Review. That was a congressionally mandated document to, to be produced every four years. Uh, three years ago, we said that the Cyber Posture Review needed to include an assessment, quote, an assessment of the potential cost, benefits, and value of any of establishing a cyber force as a separate, uniformed service. 
yet when we got the document, it did not include that assessment. Why is that? Why did DOD ignore that requirement from Congress? Uh, so first of all, no intentional uh, uh, ignoring of any p provision of the law there, that, that oversight, I will uh, dig into how that happened. But I will say this, uh, Congressman, we are working hard on answering that problem. It's been tasked in the FY23 NDA as part of Section 1533 of the Force Generation Study. I've been involved in conversations with your uh, staff on making sure that that study uh, what's going forward, I think it's a good study. I think it gives us enough time to look at, and I think it's really important. And one of the things that requires us to explore, among other options for forest generation, is uh, cyber service. We get that, and I understand that where you stand depends on where you sit, but it's not the prerogative of the department to decide which part of the congressional mandate you get to comply with, or hey, we'll answer, or, we'll answer it in a different report at a different time. We wanted that assessment in the cyber posture review, so I would appreciate you getting back to my team on on why that uh, didn't happen, uh, just so we can improve this process of reporting and answering uh, going forward. How do you think about retention? Um, it's, it's my understanding that uh, over the last year, the Office of the Principal Cyber Advisor has had at least seven civilians depart. That's about 75% of the office's total civilian roster. Is that a concern of yours? How do you think about improving retention? It is a concern of mine. I think, uh, frankly, I think creation of the SD Cyber will help uh, solve some of that uh, problem, but I am digging into that in my role as PCA right now, and it is a issue I am uh, determined to get after. Okay, okay. I look forward to following up on that and the other issues that I raised, and I now recognize the ranking member for five minutes. You know, when I first got to Washington, they said no one reads uh, in Washington more than one page. The chairman is an exception to that rule, but I, uh, I support uh, the effort to have reports and responsiveness, uh, because I think that's the essence of uh, democracy and oversight. So uh, we'll look forward to working with you uh, on that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me ask you, Dr. Plum, uh, given your testimony on the CCP's cyber threats, uh, how much of a threat do you think uh, TikTok poses to the United States from a cybersecurity perspective? Uh, ranking member, I would I would say that when we think about TikTok as a potential threat vector, the uh, things that come to mind are one, the scale, I mean, just a tremendous number of people in the United States use TikTok, uh, and two, the control that uh, China may have to be able to direct information through it, so there's a inf misinformation platform, uh, and then of course the data that it can collect. So it's the scale of it, I think, that is problematic really for us. And what do you think should be done about that? Uh, that's a great question. I know everyone is considering it. I think we need to be aware of these various threats uh, and be able to quantify them and be able to take action against them. I know that's a somewhat of a vague answer, sir, but I don't know if I have the exact answer for you right now. I might ask uh, General Nakasone if he has thoughts on that. Ranking Member, coming back to your uh, question, uh, if you consider one-third of the adult population receives their news from this app, one-sixth of our children are saying they're constantly on this app. If you consider that there's 150 million people every single day that, uh, that are uh, obviously touching this app, this provides you know, a foreign nation a, a platform for information operations, a, a platform for surveillance, uh, and a concern we have with regards to who controls that data. Uh, the department has already, as, uh, as, as you know, uh, banned the use of, uh, of that application on our phones. Uh, I think the broader discussion obviously rests with the policymakers now, but but certainly this is this is a piece that our nation has to consider. There's going to be other applications like this, and we're going to have to have some type of policy that uh, that protects both our, our ability to obviously uh, uh, to see materials, but also protects us from uh, an adversary's ability to conduct surveillance and information operations against us. It'd be fair to say you view that TikTok as a different order of threat than an American company on social media. I do. I mean, if you consider the fact that uh, the difference between an American company and our government, there's a, a clear separation in terms of what, the, what goes on there. If you take a look at an application like this, that uh, a nation has already said that they're going to be able to touch the data at any time they want to touch this data, this concerns, this concerns me. I'm certainly concerns uh, most people as they look at this. General Nakasone, when we, we spoke, you had an interesting idea about scholarships specifically uh, in STEM fields or in fields that uh, uh, could be of use in AI and quantum computing for 
the services. Uh, could you speak to that and uh, provide maybe some suggestions of what we could do as a committee on that? One of the things that uh, this committee and uh, the broader Congress has done is, is create programs like Scholarship for Service that has been tremendously helpful for organizations like uh, U.S. Cyber Command, but broader organizations within our government. Uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, as, many, uh, as many members have looked at and talked about, is the future for our nation, it's the future for our economy, it's the future for our national defense. Uh, so any type of scholarship that would obviously focus uh, young people on this uh, growing importance of this field where they're able to study it and then perhaps give back to any part of the government I think is, is something that's honorable. Uh, and I think that's something that our, our government and certainly uh, organizations like U.S. Cyber Command could benefit from. Thank you. Dr. Plum, my final question is, uh, how would you assess both our offensive and defensive cyber capabilities uh, compared to uh, China or Russia? I think we are uh, uh, a premier cyber power. I think that the United States is, uh, in, under General Nakasone's leadership in particular, uh, is developing uh, exquisite capabilities. And I think uh, one of our goals looking forward is how do we make sure that we can, as uh, I think the chairman said in his opening remarks, you know, work to integrate these with maneuver uh, to be able to prevail and win in the nation's wars. Back. Mr. Luttrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General and Doctor, thank you for your service and your continued service. Doctor, I understand that you're a submariner? I was indeed, sir. That's, um, you're a special breed of human being, sir. God, God bless you for doing that. Um, my first question goes to you, Doctor. Uh, senior intelligence leaders from Cyber Command have been vocal recently about efforts and need to establish a foundational intelligence center for cyberspace. Uh, no different from the National Intelligence Center for the Army and Office of Naval Intelligence for the Navy. And in fact, there's a foundational intelligence center for just about every war fighting domain. Can you, um, <clears throat> what actions have you taken in the Pentagon have specifically pushed for this center, if any? Th thank you for that question, Congressman. I, I do think it will be important for us to make sure that we are able to provide our operators with the right uh, foundational intelligence to conduct. I mean, General Axoni obviously has a tremendous part of this. Uh, we are struggling with this question both in the cybersecurity strategy, which is hopefully uh, be published in the near future. Uh, it's it's not quite through the secretary yet, but it's on its way. Uh, and then uh, we are also looking at this from a, from an S and T standpoint as well. So we're kind of approaching from two pieces. We don't we're not there yet. I think it's pretty clear that there is a, there is a signal that this is a thing we need to be working on. Yeah, and if there's the roadblocks that we can assist with, it seems to make sense and be advantageous for something like this to be stood up. So please let us know. Yes, sir. Uh, General. Do you think JADC2, the Joint All Domain Command and Control 2, should be a part or under the purview of Cybercom? Well, certainly, uh, Congressman, this is under the purview of the Department of Defense right now. Where we add to it is obviously the cybersecurity piece of, of what gets done. This is a broader uh, element of command and control and, and ability to fuse intelligence and operations that extends even beyond U.S. Cyber Command. But we have a, a significant role ensuring that what we develop as a department is secure and is able to function uh, in the future. Seem like there's redundancy. Does it seem like if it was to split or come together, would it be more uh, effective and efficient, in your opinion? So uh, as we move forward, I think as we move from design to actually the operational piece, then I think the question is, is where does it reside? Uh, right now in the design phase, I think it's, it's uh, appropriate within the Department of Defense and uh, within the Office of Secretary of Defense and, and certainly within the Joint Staff as they move this forward. So migration would be beneficial in the future? It likely will, and I think we'll learn a lot as we start to implement this in, in different places like the Shriver War Games and Blue Flag and, and the National Training Center. Uh, but we'll have a better feel for where it actually needs to reside in the future, I think, Congressman. Okay. Can you tell me how much China, Russia, North Korea, Iran individually spent on cybersecurity, cyber infrastructure in this past year? I'd have to take that for the record, Congressman, but uh, I would tell you that one of the things that we do see is uh, a rise in both the scope and sophistication of our adversaries, both in terms of their ability to conduct cyber intrusions and attacks and their ability to defend their data. It seems to me, um, and both of you can appreciate this as well as the other uniformed men and women in the room and my colleagues on the, on the panel with me, is that the cyberspace is the next frontier of warfare. No more bombs, planes, and guns. Uh, the, the, it'll be a push of a button, um, in my opinion, is how we will be fighting these fronts. I think China is projected to spend $31 billion by 26, 
and yet I think what are we spending 13? And I think my my statement for the record would be, we need to be spending more on cyber risk, cyber threat, cyber control on our side, given the advancements of the nefarious actors around the globe. Would you agree with that statement? So, Congressman, uh, as a combatant commander, I would probably never disagree with uh, more resources. Okay. Uh, but what I would say is that um, as we take a look at the future, and you highlighted this, this is the future of, of where we need to be able to operate uh, in all domains. Uh, we're seeing this in Russia, Ukraine right now. How do you combine what we do non-kinetically with what goes on kinetically? There will always be a fight on the ground or the air or the sea but there also is going to be a fight that's going to take place in cyberspace and space. And that's one of the things that I think Russia, Ukraine has demonstrated to us. Okay, I appreciate you saying that and I, and I hope you're well aware that if inevitably with something clacks off, it'll be you all that most likely will be on the front lines. So again, thank you. I yield back, sir. Mr. Lolota. Chairman, uh, thanks so much. Uh, gentlemen, thanks so much for being here and for your staffs uh, for participating today. Uh, gentlemen, as you both know, in 2018, the U.S. Cyber Command was elevated to a unified combatant command, having been previously operating under U.S. Strategic Command since 2009. Uh, cyber is a fairly recent, complex, and critical strength and vulnerability uh, for the U.S., and Space Force is also a very recent addition as well, having been established in 2019. And while I understand the complexities of establishing and ironing out the nuances of these new commands, uh, Dr. Plum, in prior statements made to our colleagues in the Senate, you heard and personally spoke to the criticality of legislation for Space Force, specifically Section 1602 of the Fiscal Year 2022 National Defense Authorization Act, which designates the Chief of Space Operations as the, quote, force design architect, end quote, for space. Uh, so my question, Doctor, is should such a designation be considered for cyberspace as a warfighting domain on par with space? Uh, Congressman, to make sure I understand the question, you're asking if we need a uh, cyber warfare architect? Yes. I guess I'd have to think through what that would mean. Uh, I feel like it would be General Nakasone and is it a cyber command? Uh, I, I guess I just, I, that's a new question for me. I'd be happy to take that for, uh, for a look up. I'm not, I think the fundamental question would be would it change anything? Or would we already be doing it and then we yeah, would just Are we on it? the right track right now, organization? I, I think we are on the right track. We're investing in our joint cyber warfare architecture uh, in this budget and have continued to do so and making sure that's modernized. And I, I feel like we are on the right track. The general may have some pieces to add, but I, I think we're going in the right direction. I'm not sure that that designation would change that at all. So, Congressman, you hit a very important date, 2018. Well, not only the fact that U.S. Cyber Command's elevated to strategic uh, or, or to combatant command, but the fact that authorities, policies, and capability come together in 18. We demonstrate that in the defense of the 2018 midterm elections. And then as you see everything afterwards, whether or not it was ransomware, whether or not it was uh, actions against other adversaries, whether or not it's election security, this is the key starting point. And the, one of the big things that uh, we were the beneficiaries of was, was this committee's uh, decision in the FY 2019 NDAA to call cyber a traditional military activity that allowed us to conduct operations like hunt forward operations. This is tremendously important. I think what you're also talking about is that the work isn't done. And so when you think about uh, cyber, we need to make sure that a simulation capability, much in the same way we have in other domains, is res resident within cyber to, in to include and to reinforce the, the advances we've already made. Thank you. And, and following up on organizationally uh, how we're proceeding, uh, Dr. Plum, to you, the, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict is responsible for information operations, but the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy is responsible for cyberspace operations. So my question is, can you explain the logic as to why these two separate chains are established for operations within the same informational environment? Uh, Yes, thanks, Congressman. First of all, uh, military operations, uh, the chain of command, of course, is through uh, COCOMs or through the Secretary. Uh, the policy oversight piece, and then sometimes, so for instance, ASD Solik has some secretary like authorities over SOCOM. But information operations are not just the purview of cyber. Cyber is one vector for information operations. It's certainly not the whole piece. Uh, so I actually think that the split does, does make sense when you take that into account. 
Thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, my last question is for uh, for the general. Uh, general, how do you envision the um, cyber mission force and the cyber operations force maturing over the next three to five years? Congressman, uh, we began with a force 133 teams. Uh, the secretary in the, the summer of 2020 authorized 14 new teams to be uh, uh, to be built. Uh, Congress has, has authorized the funding for that, so we're in the the build of 14 more teams. So I, I think. The first part of it is greater capacity. Uh, we are on a road to have more teams to be able to do more missions. Secondly is clearly uh, being able to play to our strengths. What's our competitive advantage? Our competitive advantage is information. So being able to further uh, leverage artificial intelligence, machine learning. And the third piece is it's all about our partnerships. This is what we've learned. It's, it's not only the partnerships with the National Security Agency, but broadly, how do we partner with FBI and CISA? How do we look at a series of international partners that, that provide our nation greater capacity? And most importantly, perhaps, how do we partner with the private sector? This is what we've learned in Russia, Ukraine. The power of partnering with the private sector provides our nation a tremendous advantage that no other nation has. Thank you, and I, I'll just close by saying I join with my colleague from Texas in uh, the thought that you are on the front lines of our next biggest battle, and we appreciate the work that you're doing. I yield, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Marine Soldier McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in medicine, we talk about a scotoma as being a blind spot. In business, when you talk about it, it could be something that you just get used to, and, and you forget that it's there, and only the new guy coming in can see it. Uh, and, and when we talk about the military and its preparedness, one of the things that concerns me is that, especially in this arena, because it's so quick moving, and we're watching China in, in so many other ways go after our resources, go after critical alliances. Um, they're outpacing us in, in port production and, and valuable resources we're not going to be able to get to pretty soon. What do you think that they're going to do to try to cut us off? In other words, what, would she, what should we be looking at for, as a blind spot in preparedness uh, to, to outpace the Chinese and the Russians when it comes to preparing for the next battle in cyber? I'll, I'll take that. Um, so, Congressman, I think it's all about information. I, I think this is, this is where our competitive advantage is today, and our competitive advantage in the future needs to be information. How do we take the information from our most sensitive sources? How do we take the information from the private sector? How do we take information from a series of partners? This is what we have done for many, many years. This is what we've demonstrated as a, as a kinetic force. This is the same uh, power that we need to continue to demonstrate as, demonstrate as a non-kinetic force. When I think about China and Russia, you know, our ability to stay ahead of them in, in areas like artificial intelligence, machine learning, in a series of partnerships, and being able to leverage the private sector, this is what we must continue to do. That's, that's the blind spot we never can uh, kind of look away from. We have to make sure that we're watching this very carefully. So one of the things I noticed when we talk about investing in the future, and I was looking at colleges, for example, and how much money we as the government put in, about half versus the civilian, which I, I really appreciate your, your comment on combining civilian with military resources to advance our technologies. Uh, but one of the things that concerns me is we have a lot of foreign students over here that we're paying the bill on uh, both through the civilian and government agencies to educate. And then some of them are returning back to China. Some of them are staying here from China in America. And we've had problems with this in the past as far as giving up our data to other countries that are pilfering. They're putting a tremendous amount, just like uh, uh, Congressman Luttrell said, they're putting a tremendous amount of assets to develop their own. And then they're coming over here, and in my, my opinion, they're stealing our information. And sometimes we're just giving it to them. Uh, in our highest educated universities. Uh, I, I was a professor at Georgia Tech, and we, I participated in an investigation in somebody who got put in jail over that same exact thing. How do we protect our information from uh, being stolen when we, when we do education like that? And I'll, I'll leave that for Dr. Bloom. Uh, well, sir, I guess I would say that, one, I'm in certainly no position to comment on uh, university hiring practices, but I will say that uh, comes to classified information or the information of our defense industrial base, we need to make sure we have proper vetting for anyone uh, to make sure that they are not uh, some type of a threat and it doesn't really matter where they're from for that situation. It really depends on if we're doing our proper vetting. And then the second part would be to make sure that the information we are trying to protect, that we're doing the most modern things to do so, moving towards zero trust, making sure we have two-factor authentication or whatever the latest requirements are. But just 
a lot of cyber hygiene uh, is democratized all the way down to the lowest level, and it's a hard problem. It's one of the things the government is trying to get after by sharing more information with uh, private industry and with universities on how to protect this information to make sure these things don't happen at the scale you're, you're suggesting. Okay, thanks. Uh, my final was just organizationally. I, I had somebody stop by my office and talk about a department and, and cyber, and I know this has been brought up already, uh, but do you think it would be, be if it had to be folded under a department, kind of like you have the Department of Navy and Marine Corps, uh, do you think it would be better folded under an army or, or under space? Because uh, just given its intellectual capacity and its application to outer space now, would it be better to be folded under or a separate standalone department? Uh, Congressman, I think you're asking uh, about whether we should form a cyber service and if we did where it would nest. I guess I would say that I think, you know, first of all, we are taking a hard look at whether we should form a cyber service to provide the best uh, effective cyber operations. I think our focus should be how do we get after the threat most effectively with these taxpayer dollars, and that threat in particular is that of China. So I think that's really how we should focus these, uh, our, our thoughts and our, and, our, and our approach. So stand alone or, or fold under a certain department already exists? I would not want to get ahead of any decision that really rests for the Secretary. Just a recommendation. I was just curious. Okay. Thank you. With that, I yield. Gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much for being here this morning. Uh, General Nakasone, uh, last year uh, you briefed us about uh, your hunt forward efforts in Ukraine uh, in advance of the Russian invasion. Uh, now looking back, uh, having a little period of time to look back, how successful do you think those efforts have been to date? And, how do you gauge uh, the success in Russia countering uh, what you're doing in that respect? And is there anything at all that surprised you uh, with this experience? Congressman, if I might just take a step back, uh, Hunt Forward Operations began in 2018 as, as we started to think about how do we secure our nation's elections. And one of the uh, bright ideas from a young captain said, hey, why don't we send a team of eight to 10 military members to a country at their request, hunt on their networks with them, and share all of that information, not only with the country, but broadly with uh, industry, so industry can see what's going on. Well, since that time, we have conducted 47 missions in 22 countries on 70 different networks. Four of them, four of them have been in Ukraine. Those four operations, to include the operation that took place 70 days prior to the invasion, I think were extremely successful. Uh, not only were we able to identify the tradecraft, not only were we able to identify some of the malware, but we were able to reassure a partner that we were going to provide support. And I think that, amongst all of the different things that has occurred, is inc incredibly important. Yeah, nothing, did anything surprise you or jump out at you during that experience? Uh, so uh, I would Russia. say just in general, surprises, uh, surprises with regards to our hunt forward operations is just how impactful they have become and how popular they are with a series of different nations. Every country that, that I meet with says, hey, can we do a hunt forward operation with you? And so I think to, to the Congressman's point about the future structure and what does the U.S. Cyber Command look like uh, in the years to come, I think there is going to be a, a large component that's going to be doing, doing these type of operations. Yeah, I've, I've been very impressed just from my vantage point because that was a, one of our greatest concerns entering this, uh, just what you know, Russia might do and what efforts would be available to Ukraine uh, to counter it. And, and I think that work uh, that you described is, is critical and will continue to be critical in that regard. Congressman, can I, can I just add one comment to that? You asked me about surprises, uh, and I think, I'm not sure if this fits in that category, but one of the things that's communicated to me by the young men and women that lead these teams, to include the Marine Major who uh, led the team into Kyiv, is the fact that she told me that when I got on the ground, I was meeting with three and four-star generals, sometimes the Minister of Defense, sometimes uh, you know, significant players in the, uh, in the government that were well above my pay grade. And uh, it just goes to speak to the, to the leadership and the capabilities of the people that lead these teams. And how, how they really first foresaw the, the difficulty that Russia could have imposed there. Uh, I'm just following up on an earlier theme that I've had. Uh, uh, Dr. Craig Martell, who's the DOD's first chief digital Ar uh, artificial intelligence officer, uh, briefed us uh, earlier this year uh, about workforce issues uh, and how we're currently leveraging or planning to leverage aspects of artificial intelligence as a core competency of the cyber mission force to help them execute their offensive and defensive missions. Uh, you know, if you aren't already, how are you integrating AI and this kind of training pipeline into the cyber force? 
is it, are you engaging because some of the uh, existing relationships and partnerships ha have in the private side? Has that been something that's been helpful? Congressman, let me, let me uh, tackle that in a, a couple different ways. First of all, that uh, to better understand where the talent exists, you have to go to where the talent is, you know, is, is you know, occup occupying space right now, and that's in our academic institutions. So U.S. Cyber Command a little over a year ago started the academic network to reach out to a series of 100 plus universities within the United States to uh, talk about what we do and encourage people to uh, consider government service. The second piece is we've taken a very, very hard look at artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning to look at uh, you know, the defense of the DOD information network. Every single day, as Mr. Martel no noted out, uh, talked about, was the fact that you know, we have to have an ability to defend our networks, our data, and our weapon systems. AI and ML is doing that to, in some part today. And the third part is, is that uh, we need a broader base of this expertise. To the chairman's point, uh, a number of different uh, um, measures have been passed in the NDAAs for this command. One of the ones that, uh, that has been very, very helpful is cyber accepted service, which is 97% now of our civilian population uh, are utilizing. It provides us extra uh, pays and, uh, and uh, abilities to attract top talent. And the other one that we're looking at very, very carefully was passed in the 21 NDAA, which is section 1708, to look at a series of very high tech personnel that can come into our command. We are now targeting four that we anticipate to hire off that. Those are with increased pays that allow us to, to go after the talent that's necessary to bring that to our command. Well, thank you. And uh, in my own district, uh, with the Navy uh, and Undersea Warfare Institute and the University of Massachusetts, they have models and curriculum that are right there. So uh, I'd like to see that continue. I yield back. The pride of Texas, Pat Fallon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Plum, which branch of the military is in charge of maritime domain? Uh, the United States Navy. How about land domain? The Army. Air. Air Force. Cyber. Uh, fair. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what I'm talking about. We're here today, uh, and we're talking about cyber being the fastest growing domain. And, and it's, uh, it bothers me that uh, not only do we not know who's in charge, it seems, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. We, we need a leader uh, for this, because as we just said, we, I heard my colleague say, next frontier, and it's going to be the front lines of the next conflict. And when you think about the, how inexpensive it is relative to the potential impact and damage that cyber can do today, it, it kind of harkens for me, Billy Mitchell comes to mind, uh, General Billy Mitchell, who rang the alarm in the 1920s about the importance of air and got court-martialed for it uh, because he saw the future. We can't fight the war today, we gotta to fight the war tomorrow and prepare for that. And it seems to me, you know, when, when I look at Cybercom's mission statement, it includes one, defend the Department of Defense Information Network. Two, strengthen the nation's ability to withstand and respond to cyber attacks. And then three, conduct full spectrum cyber operations to assist combat commanders and the joint force. And that reads well on paper, but the third one is the one that concerns me because, you know, the Navy's gonna be concerned about uh, the sea with a side of cyber and the Air Force, you know, air with a side of cyber, and Army land side of cyber. Uh, and, you know, I, I would really, I strongly feel that we should be creating a seventh branch and making cyber a cyber service. And General Noxoni, I know that you don't talk uh, particularly, uh, policy is, you know, our job and yours is one to implement it, but uh, would you accept command of a cyber service, sir? So, Congressman, uh, I would offer that, you know, that is obviously, as, as you said, a policy decision. But, but let me just uh, provide a thought on this in terms of how we, how we model ourselves. And uh, I think, uh, as you asked, uh, a number of different uh, who is, who's in charge of special operations. Special operations is not, in tr not in run by any sp specific service yet. It is the elite service uh, and capability that our nation has. That's what we have modeled ourselves at U.S. Cyber Command. This idea of having special and unique authorities that we're able to train and man and equip our force, an agility to maneuver. Uh, and I think that that's, a, from my pr uh, perspective of having uh, commanded now for five years, that's a really good uh, place where we're emulating towards and making sure that our focus is on doing operations against our adversaries and continuing to build our capability. Well, you know, it, it, General Knox, you'd seen earlier that there, there are always going to be a land and there's air and then space. And, you know, we made a space service. 
uh, because it's ever changing and, uh, and evolving. And I was, I'm, I'm glad we did because of that importance. But I, I really would argue that we should consider, strongly consider, we didn't get a report for it, uh, but strongly consider cyber as its own service. And we have 800, uh, over $800 billion budget and 13 and a half billion is going to cyber, less than 2%. So it's one thing that I, I really want to ring the alarm bells and I think that's something that we should be seriously considering. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Ms. Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, thank you to the two of you for coming on out here and, and talking to us about this. Uh, Jeno, I wanted to start with you. Um, uh, over the last couple of months, I've been engaged with a lot of ambassadors and other interlocutors from uh, partner nations of ours in the Indo-Pacific, talking about you know what are some areas of cooperation we can focus on. I, I, I think coalition building is so critical. Uh, especially given the challenges we face there. And, and one thing that kind of keeps coming up over and over and over again is their concerns about their capabilities when it comes to cybersecurity and whether or not that is at the level that is needed. This is something that I feel like would not only help uh, them in terms of their capabilities and their ability to prevent vulnerabilities, but also in terms of our ability to work with them and engage, whether that's intel sharing or other capacities there. But you see, you know, major partners of ours like Japan having significant challenges uh, across their society when it comes to this, uh, a lot of the ASEAN nations and others. So I, I guess I just wanted to ask you if you would support or if you think it would be a good thing for us to do to to try to increase our engagement our efforts to be able to lift up their baseline of of cybersecurity capabilities in the in the indo-pacific is that something that you think would be valuable here congressman i i certainly do think it would be a value and we're doing that right now i just returned from uh, an 11-day tour of uh, many nations to include several of them in the in the Indo-Pacific region. And you're right, the number one topic that they, they talk about is how do we work together with cybersecurity? This is the way that we're doing it at U.S. Cyber Command. First of all, uh, through a series of exercises. So Cyber Flag is our major exercise that takes place every summer. Uh, this summer it will have over 30 nations from uh, from around the world to participate with us. Secondly is through bilateral uh, arrangements where we go and, and work with the force uh, to ensure that uh, they develop the capacity and capability to defend their own networks. And the last piece, which is I think just a, a uh, incredible success story for uh, the Department of Defense is a state partnership program that the National Guard runs uh, that provides a continuous ability for us uh, within the department to have relationships, to have exercises, to have uh, an exchange of ideas with, with a nation. The state partnership yeah. program that was run by California and, and is run by California with Ukraine is a great example of this. This is the platform that we've been using. Do you feel like there's, so uh, that, that's really good to hear about the different facets in which this is happening. Do you think that there's room to scale this up and room to be able to increase this capability and this kind of engagement? I do, and I, I'm seeing it already through our operations with Hunt Forward where we've had a number of different nations within the Pacific have, have asked us, uh, and the department has agreed for us to deploy to those uh, areas to do that. Dr. Plum, what are, what are your thoughts on this right now? Uh, Congressman, fully uh, agree with your concerns and with General Axsoni's statements, we are working on this. Uh, and your point is exactly right, which is that the more we can build the capacity of our allies and partners to defend themselves, then the more capacity we have to get after the adversary uh, under the theory of a uh, fixed number of resources, even if that number keeps going up. So it's, it's a strategic advantage to us to be able to do this. And the other part is, and this is really important, sir, it doesn't just unlock cyber cooperation. It unlocks all sorts of other parts of deeper cooperation, uh, the foundation of which is decent cybersecurity processes so that information can be protected so we can share more information with all these parties. Absolutely yeah. essential. I, I just think this could be such a good win-win. It can really help us build just these deeper lateral horizontal connections uh, while also sort of hardening uh, some of the, again, the vulnerabilities that we face in that uh, in that region, which we know are, are immense there. And, and, and General, I, I appreciate that you talked about some of those different facets because you know that reserve components you know specifically our, our national guard members they built incredible cyber capabilities you know in my uh, and one of those guard programs that state partnership program 
Uh, that's something that's been incredibly fruitful. You know, we have the 140th Air National Guard Cyber Operations Squadron at Joint Base McGuire-Dix Lakehurst in my district. And, you know, looking at their ability to be able to partner with these nations, it seems like that's essential. So I know you kind of raised that earlier, but it sounds like that's something as well that we can continue to, to push on in terms of thinking about how to surge up these types of efforts. Is that right? Congressman, the uh, Minister of Defense from Albania came to visit U.S. Cyber Command. And one of the first things uh, that he did was to recognize the New Jersey National Guard for the work that was done on a hunt forward operation. He told us that. He knew the, he knew the captain and the lieutenant colonel that was leading those teams to, to help his nation as, as they came under cyber attack. This is a really good example of building partnerships in a way that we should be doing in the future. Well, I look forward to working with you on that. Thank you. Mr. Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's good to see you again, General Noxoni. Uh, I remember back in the 90s when President Bill Clinton said, that we were at risk of a space arms race. And our country put a bit of a pause on some of our space work. And the governing theory was if we paused, we could slow down and make space more of a safe domain and not a contested domain. And the reality we know as we sit here now is while we may have paused during some years in the 90s, our adversaries did not. Uh, Russia, China, Iran, they all became more capable in this regard. And so I just wanted to get your initial take on a similar call for a pause regarding AI right now. We've seen some of the largest tech leaders, including Elon Musk, sign this letter saying that the advancement of AI is such that we ought to take a pause and determine how to frame those capabilities. What's your assessment of whether or not America's adversaries would follow the lead of principally U.S. tech companies? My sense, Congressman, is that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is, is something that uh, is resident today and is, is something that our adversaries are going to continue to uh, look to exploit and, and moving forward. Do you worry that if U.S. companies take a pause, that that could constrain some of the um, capability development that you testified earlier is so necessary in getting people interested and engaged in AI? So, Congressman, I, I guess I really haven't, uh, haven't thought about that. That's a, a piece of policy that, uh, that I'm, I'm sure will be uh, discussed in the future. But uh, what I am focused on is how do we build a bigger pool of people that have this capability and capacity to work it? How do we engage with academic institutions to encourage young people to study AI and machine learning? How do we get them interested in governance service? How do we continue to, to utilize this in the future? I fully share that vision, and I think the future of the country literally may depend on it. Um, but, you know, and I am not an expert in AI. I'm just starting to use and understand the technology uh, intentionally. And uh, it seems to me, if you've got some of the big tech influencers in our country saying, whoa, whoa, pause, uh, don't expand commercial vectors in AI, that could be counterproductive to the goals you just stated about enhanced engagement in our country. Do you, uh, do you share that concern? So again, Congressman, you know, my, my focus right now is being able to develop the talent and the techniques and the, and the tradecraft as we look forward to, to utilizing this, you know, this important uh, advantage that our nation has. And, and as you look at the AI domain right now, we would, we would certainly have to concede there are some areas where China's ahead, right? I, I think right now as we take a look at the AI and machine learning domain, what we need to be focused on is how do we look at it in a, in a way that we can use it responsibly, uh, not only for our national defense, but also for our economy. At, at U.S. Cyber Command, we are very, very interested in, in the use of large language models and the ability right, right, to- But who's ahead? My question is, who's ahead right now? The United States is ahead. You think we're ahead, we're ahead of China and AI currently? I do. Currently? And, and what's your basis for that belief? Uh, again, uh, discussions with experts, but, but I think that this is a tenuous uh, place that we're at as well. This is being developed in the United States. This is being developed by a, you know, a series of entrepreneurs and, and those that are, are working it. But this isn't take, we should not take this for granted, that this is going to be the way of the, uh, in the future. And so we need to continue to, uh, to invest in it and work it and continue to, to utilize it. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, we don't have the classified room until 10 a.m. It's not my in intention to filibuster until 10 a.m., but I do want to entertain a second round of question if any members have, have one. I will uh, start with myself. Um, General Nakasone, um, I want you to imagine you're talking to, let's say, my grandma, who's a great lady. She's extremely smart, but it's fair to say she's more concerned about her great granddaughters than she is about China and cyber. In terms that she could understand, explain the threat 
that the Chinese Communist Party poses in cyberspace? Uh, Mrs. Gallagher, uh, good morning. I'm General Nakasone. Technically, Virginia Justice is her name. Mrs. Right. Justice, good morning. Yeah. I'm General Nakasone. As we think about um, our nation, one of the things that uh, I uh, think 